Hometown Ghost Stories contains serious and often distressing events and is not intended for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Agatha and her little brother Tom walked by the old Matthias Ham house every day. It had been abandoned for 15 years or so at this point, and the locals had begun to share ghost stories of the place to each other. The siblings always got an uneasy feeling when passing through, but today was even worse. They were returning home a bit later than normal, and the sun was rapidly dissipating and turning the bright blue sky pitch black. As they walked, Tom turned to his slightly older sister and said, Do you think any of the stories are true? Agatha replied, No way, that's just stuff they tell kids to keep them from breaking in and exploring the place. They continued down the road, and as they did, a light from the third floor caught both their attention at exactly the same time. Isn't it supposed to be empty? Tom said in utter disbelief. Yeah, was all that Agatha could get out. As they stared, the light began to flash frantically, almost like someone was in distress. Maybe we should go get help, Tom said while grabbing his sister's arm. At this point, Agatha stopped walking and just stared at the light from the window. Sure, run home and let mom and dad know. I'm going to go in and see what's going on. No way, Tom shouted at his sister. Are you crazy? Someone dangerous could be in there. Tom, just go get mom and dad. I'll be fine. I just want to make sure no one's hurt, she snapped back. Tom began to run down the road as Agatha approached the front door. She noticed that it was already open, about six inches. She pushed it forward, and a long, drawn-out groan, almost like the door was in pain, was let out, as the moonlight filled the room with a small glimmer of light. Agatha looked around the first floor to see if anyone was there. Hello? 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 She shouted out several times to no replies. The fear was setting in more, but she knew she had to at least check out the room with the light in the window on the third floor. She walked up the stairs, listening to see if she could hear anything at all. Nothing. She approached the room after climbing the stairs and opened the door. There sat the lantern she saw from the street. Who could have lit this, she thought. She walked over to the window and approached the lantern. As she inspected it, her brain was trying to uncover the mystery as to who could have lit it, and she decided to put it out and wait for her family outside to be safe. The moment she extinguished the flame, the door to the room slammed shut. Agatha's jaw dropped in pure terror. As she sat there, she began to hear footsteps slowly walking around on the first floor. There was no way this could be her family. Tom would probably just now be making it back to the house. Agatha pushed her back against the wall while staring at the door to the room. The footsteps moved around the first floor slowly, methodically. Then she heard them start to climb the stairs. A foot would hit the stairs, and then it would feel like hours before the next one came down. Agatha was terrified. Who was this? When the person finally made it to the top, she could make out they were now coming straight for the room she was in. The footsteps approached the door. Then nothing. Agatha sat there. Was she making this up? Just as she got ready to get up and head to the door, a loud knock began. Agatha began to cry as she put her arms over her head. Out of nowhere, she heard two loud bangs, almost as if they had come from the room she was in. Then something outside the door hit the ground, hard. Everything got quiet. As Agatha sat there, she heard her father yelling her name from outside the window from a distance. Relieved, she looked out the window to see her family walking towards the house armed with lanterns of their own. She decided to make a break for the door and to run to her parents and brother. Halfway to the closed door, it swung open, and the dark shadow figure of a man appeared and began to drag her down the hall. All she could see as she was pulled away was the lantern and the window light back up before she disappeared into the darkness. I'm Rob Coakley, 
and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, Dubuque, Iowa. Dubuque is a town in Iowa that sits right along the Mississippi River and borders close to Wisconsin and Illinois. First officially charted in 1833, it is named after Julian Dubuque, who was a Quebec pioneer who began to mine the area's rich lead deposits. Iowa would officially be named a state in 1846, and the town was included in that formation. A town mostly known for its tourism being so close to the Mississippi River, it is also known for some of its paranormal locations. Dubuque Grand Opera House The Grand Opera House opened its doors on August 14, 1890 and has been a staple in the town ever since. Beginning as a building that housed plays, some of the names that would pass through included Jack Benny, Will Rogers, and even Henry Fonda. Years later, it would be converted into a theater for a time, but since then, major renovation projects have restored it mostly to its original design. Forty years into the building's existence, the stories of the hauntings would begin. In the 1930s, various cleaning workers would call the police repeatedly over the years to report that they heard voices coming from the stage and that no one else should be in the building. The police would show up, and they would find nobody. The stage seems to be the setting for most of the ghostly activity in the building. Not only talking has been heard coming from the stage, but singing has been heard from those working on set designs or rehearsing. Generally, before these voices are heard, reports state that the people in the area get hit with a blast of cold air. On one occasion, a stage worker was in the theater alone painting a set for an upcoming production. He heard the sounds of someone walk across the stage with a bead clanking sound, as if they were in costume. As he looked around the stage for a source of the noise, he was met with the burst of cold air, and he immediately exited the opera house and vowed to never work there again while alone. Lights and electronics have also experienced paranormal situations. Lights going on and off on their own, only for electricians to find nothing wrong with the wiring, is one such frequent situation. One of the more bizarre stories involves a camcorder. A man was recording a play one evening when his camera began to zoom in and out on its own. Unable to fix it in the moment, he let it happen for a bit before shutting it off. When he went home and reviewed the footage, there was a ghostly presence on stage right before the camera started to malfunction. After talking to a few others that were there that night, he was able to find out that another woman caught the same image before her camera began to do the same thing with the zoom. Objects have also been known to be moved about the building. While decorating for Christmas, a volunteer even witnessed a box of decorations move from one side of a room to another on its own. And it turns out it's not just the spirits of former actors haunting the theater. During rehearsal for a play, Members of the production saw small groups of apparitions appear in flashes and period clothing towards the back of the auditorium. They would quickly appear and disappear in different spots until they disappeared for the night moments later. The Hotel Julian Often when guests would cross the Mississippi, the first thing they would lay eyes on in Dubuque was the hotel that sits on the corner of 2nd and Main. In fact, a hotel has been at this location since 1839. Originally called the Wapples House, it is now known as the Hotel Julian. Not only has this building survived a fire in 1913, but it's also hosted some famous guests over the years, such as Abraham Lincoln, Buffalo Bill Cody, and Mark Twain. Lincoln stayed here before his presidency as he was on business inspecting over 705 miles of railroad properties when he was the legal counsel for the Illinois Central Railroad Company. The hotel is believed to have a more infamous guest that would frequent it as well. If you guessed Al Capone, then you would be right. It's believed that when things would get hot in Chicago, Capone and his crew would drive to Dubuque and park their cars in an underground garage to further hide the fact that they were there. There's even belief that he owned the hotel for a short period of time, although there's no actual proof of this. 
It is believed that he is the ghost that makes up the majority of the hauntings in this hotel. The eighth floor is said to be the place where the most paranormal activity takes place, which is the same floor that Capone and his gang would hide out in when in town. Lights turning off and on, and the apparition of a man in 1920s period clothing floating through the halls is believed to be Capone himself, which has been seen frequently. The freight elevator also reportedly operates on its own, with multiple trips from repairmen saying nothing is wrong with it. And an apparition of a woman has been seen by staff and guests frequently on the lower floors. However, there was no leads to this spirit's identity from when they were alive. The Matthias Ham House. Matthias Ham began construction on his dream house in 1839. He would share this home for years with his first wife and their three children until 1856 when she would pass away. After this tragedy, he would put up a grand addition on the house, which included three more floors, and the house would be heavily constructed of limestone. The family loved to entertain guests, and the property would even be referred to as Southerner's Open House because of this. Anyone of note visiting the town would often pass through the Ham's house. Matthias made and lost fortunes through numerous business ventures, including mining, lumber, and ship fleeting, to name a few. From the mansion, he would watch his ships out on the water, and one day, this would pay off big time. He noticed a group of pirates harassing his boats on the water, and informed authorities, who swiftly captured and jailed a lot of river pirates. It's said that this group vowed revenge on Matthias. Although at one time one of the wealthiest citizens, Matthias would lose the majority of his fortune, but would always work extremely hard so that his family never lost the house. Upon his death, his widow would rent out rooms to people to help maintain the bills. And this would carry over to his daughter Sarah, who inherited the house and rented space in it out to the Kegler Cancer Clinic. Sarah would also have one of the scariest occurrences happen to her while living in the house. While living alone, she kept her bedroom on the third floor. While reading in her room one night, she began to hear a strange noise from downstairs. Quietly, she began to listen and could hear someone downstairs roaming around and going through her things. She was careful not to alert the intruder, and eventually, that night they would leave without taking anything. The next day, she told neighbors about the situation, and they all came up with a plan that if it happened again that night, she would put a lantern in the window to signal that she needed help. Later that night, once again, she heard someone in her house. She quickly lit the lantern, then yelled out, Who's there? when she heard the person in the hallway. No one answered. Thinking quickly, she rushed over and locked her bedroom door, and grabbed her rifle and waited. This alerted whoever was in the house, and heavy footsteps began up the staircase. They marched right to the bedroom door and began to try and enter. Sarah steadied herself and took two shots at the door. The person began to retreat back down the stairs. Alert neighbors, meanwhile, had seen the lantern and rushed over to help. By the time they got there, they followed a trail of blood from outside the bedroom door to the riverbed. At the end of the blood trail lay a known local pirate captain dead from the gunshot wounds. The ham house would stay in the family until Sarah's death in which she had made arrangements for the town to take it over. The house would sit for a number of years until the Dubuque Historical Society formed in 1950, and they would go on to restore the house and open it as a museum, which it still serves as today. In that time, numerous hauntings have been reported by people visiting the old house. It's believed multiple spirits reside here, but two specifically are known to make their presence felt more frequently. The first, is Matthias Ham himself. On multiple occasions, workers in the house have reported the feeling of a presence watching over them while they do their job. Occasional cold spots in the room where they're working also appear with no explanation. It is believed that Mr. Ham is watching over them while they work on his home. A visitor one time while on a tour was mocking the stories of the spirits being told. On his way out the door, he made one final jab at the spirits. As he did, the front doors ripped out of his hand, slamming back hard into the door frame. 
One of the curators was alone at the house one evening, closing up when they had to head down a dark hallway. Without having a light, they felt the presence help guide them down the hallway, helping them get to the area of the house they needed to in order to leave. It is also believed that Mr. Ham wants a light on at all times, as lights that have been shut off have often been reported to be turned back on frequently. The other entity is said to have a much darker presence. It is believed that the ghost of the pirate shot within the house is still roaming, especially on the third floor. Extreme cold spots and chills on people's bodies frequently happen on this floor. A light has been seen moving throughout the mansion's hallways and on the staircase. Many believe that this was one of the pirates that Matthias had arrested that would vow revenge on him and his family. Because of the fact Sarah shot and killed him before he could enact it, his spirit is doomed to roam the mansion for eternity. What's going on, folks? Welcome into Hometown Ghost Stories, episode number 63. And we are talking about Dubuque, Iowa. Did I say that correctly, Rob? Dubuque? De yeah, Dubuque. That's what I'm going to do to Dave at some point in his life. I'm going to Dubuque him. Well, I wouldn't be the one to Dubuque that. Dave, welcome in. Thank wow. you. This is why. Because. <laughs> because. I'm about to get Dubuque by both of us. Yeah. The Bukes for for all because of you sent you sent me the uh, the location. You're like I'm covering this location. I'm looking at it. I'm like, oh man, does that say W? <laughs> like, is that, <laughs> what is that word? <laughs> you and you know, like even though we're saying it right and we're saying it the way that I saw everyone pronounce online, we're still gonna get like a three star review from someone like actually, you know, when you when you do this, you should learn how to say the word Dubuque, the box, the book, WK, yeah. WK. Only three people in the world know how to pronounce it, but you should be one of those three. How dare you? If you can't tell, we got another negative review this week. Because I don't think I've got three stars and technically three, considered a Yeah, I guess three review. stars is technically positive. We're not supposed to talk about anything but five stars, though, so that's the last you're going to hear of it. Yeah. So you don't get your review read. But yeah, we pronounced King Tut wrong. King Tut. We did not, actually. I pronounced... Wow. Um, <laughs> hot. He's, yeah, I got called out on uh, two alleged mispronunciations. One I did mispronounce, the other one I did not. <laughs> All right. Well, noted. Uh, I want to welcome in everyone that's hanging out in live chat, everyone hanging out on Facebook as well. Uh, we have a good crowd here, and the bingo cards are a flow, and there will be a prize for anyone who can manage to win bingo at the end of the stream. And we will also have we're also doing a giveaway as well. So for anyone, I believe it's exclusive on YouTube right now. The giveaway but if you're on facebook just type it in and i'll manually enter you in but all you have to do is type the word stickers in chat and you will be entered into the giveaway at the end of the stream we're giving away a bundle of the brand new hometown ghost stories stickers you'll get a five pack of random selected limited edition locations very cool stuff and for those of you who are listening to the audio version we'll also be doing a giveaway uh for anyone who joins the discord and wants to get entered into an off stream raffle type thing so uh, that is that all you gotta do is type the word stickers in chat. You'll be entered in, but, uh, what's up to everybody who's hanging out. I see Troy here. I see Matthew T Ian Kate is here. Papa Squatch, Rachel Brennan pinky is here. Uh, Stephanie's everybody who's Mariah. hanging out. We appreciate you guys. Mariah as well. So thank you guys so much. Pinky wants Capone stickers. You know, what? we should, <laughs> we should just well. do all, why, why did we get anything else printed? They should all just be Al Capone and <laughs> surprise you got Al Capone again. Yeah. We should hide him in every sticker. Like you have to, you have to <laughs> know, find he's in every location. You have to find where Al Capone is in the sticker. Um, all of all of the stickers are Al Capone stickers. Yeah, Not every all single of the location. Yeah, all the locations. You just can't escape him. I was looking through Iowa. It, the, the Al Capone story is not even the one that like caught my attention. It was the Matthias Ham House that I was reading about, and then I'm like, all right, well, let me find some other locations in Dubuque, Iowa, and I'm like, all right. I'm just going to give everybody what they want this week. They're just going to get everything. They're going to get the pirates. They're going to get Al Capone. And 
And that's what we're going to do for episode 63. That's it. I like it. We just can't get away from it. So if you have Al Capone on your bingo card, you could check him off. And uh, you probably already had him checked off because you just knew it was coming, right? Has to. It was coming. It but yeah, has Pirates to. and Al Capone at this point. Al Capone I just will, the free space. <laughs> I will say that this Al Capone story makes more sense. We'll, we'll just jump into this. Unless there's something else you want to hit on that's not episode related first, Jesse. No, no, go ahead. Um, this one makes sense in the aspect that like it's so close to illinois where if he was feeling some heat he could jump right over the border here because this is right over the the line right and back in the day jumping state borders was a big deal like they would not follow you a lot of the times over the state border and this hotel's right there so um it makes a lot more sense than like when he's in like you know I I don't remember Paris. that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in Paris, right? So I don't uh, think I, he ever went to Paris, but that I think that deal went down inside the United States. But of course, even when we covered Paris last time, we couldn't even get away from Al Capone. <laughs> right. So I do think this one makes more sense. And the hotel, there is a theory that he was part owner. There's nothing with his name on it, but there was uh like a ownership record that said, um something about like prominent Chicago people or something like it was worded where it didn't tell you who it was, but that people from Chicago owned it. And I think that's why people tie him to owning the hotel Julian at one point. I think there, there, there could be something to it. And I think that's obviously something that they would have uh, hit away. I, I don't know if you can, can you really hide away like a former owner of a building? Maybe he was like a silent partner or something and kind of, or, you know, maybe it was like a mobster thing where it's like they would shake down businesses and just be like, no, you know, you're going to give me 10% and I will protect your building. Mm. But it did end up getting burned down. Was that before or after the Capone situation? It was before it was 1913 that it got burnt down. So it would be before the Al Capone stuff. Um, didn't read any like fatalities or anything with that, with that fire. There was not a lot of information. It was actually tough to dig up the year on that because I wanted to find out more about it because we do have hauntings not related to Al Capone in this one, where there is a spirit of a woman. We do see the freight elevator um, going up and down on its own with like no rhyme or reason. And just because we think it's Al Capone that's haunting it doesn't mean that it is. It could just be a guy from that time frame, And the, uh, the attire would still check out for like the 19 tons. So it's true. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, the, the hotel is really interesting. It is one of the first things that you used to see when you came over here. You'd cross the river, the Hotel Julian's sitting there. There's been a hotel in this spot. Um, it was called the Hotel Waffles, which is a fun name. That is fun. Hotel life. Waffles? Delicious. Waffles. Like, wow, that's so much less delicious. Or Waples. <laughs> it's either Waffles or Waples. Um, I don't know. It's W-A-P-L-E-S. So that was the original one. And then it took some different names that all came about hotel julian which is named after the guy who basically founded this area which was julian dubuque uh so it's a it's an interesting little story it's it's an interesting little town it's another one of those like little resort getaway towns where you might want to go there for like a weekend to get away not even if you're just doing ghost stuff but it's like a quaint little getaway spot it does look cool and it looks like one of those cool small towns and obviously if it has multiple haunted locations then i would be interested in joining i would be much more interested if it was actually called the hotel waffles but you know we we're willing to make sacrifices i suppose i'm sure you can get them to serve you waffles at least and then you they can... probably have a continental breakfast right maybe at hotel waffles that's where they started the continental breakfast yeah i mean you're into role playing right you can just you know do some hotel waffles and you know yeah for sure uh, stephanie <laughs> says oh my god i'm late how was the beginning it was god awful so <laughs> you didn't miss much no it was, it was great it was fantastic as usual go back and see it yeah that's one of my i like uh, your opening story was great this week it was one of my favorites that you've done oh thank so, you uh, yeah good job on that it uh i was i my voice might be a little off on the opening of this episode i did record my audio when i was still a little bit sick so i'm like maybe that that's going to be too good maybe it deepens my voice too much and people are like oh rob should sound like that all the time going forward but like it's only because i'm sick guys i can't do it on command we're so, gonna need you to get sick just be sick every week it's that's happening lately so it might 
<laughs> there might be a three-week rotation on being sick right now. So you uh you might get that voice eventually. It's just me going, and that Tom went up the stairs. And <laughs> Then you're just gonna sound like Tom ghost. Waits just doing narration. It's gonna be fantastic. Yeah, it's gonna be the best. So, yeah. uh, so Bree mentions in chat that uh, Felalon, forgive me for that pronunciation. Felalon, place elevator company is a tram that goes up the hill in Dubuque. It's very interesting, like two trains going up and down a hill. Reminds me of a ski lift. So that is pretty cool. I did see something on that real quick. I did something similar to that, I believe, in Pittsburgh. Um, so that was – it is cool. It, it lets you see the whole city. The chat is talking once again about the oubliette. <laughs> oubliette will sound amazing then, and Ian just says, oubliette. <laughs> oubliette. If you have oubliette on your bingo card, you can check that one off. I don't think it's there, but that one should probably be added as well. We definitely need an update as the episodes go along. I don't know how much Stephanie is staying on top of that, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that is a cool little feature that the town has for sure. Like I said, I've seen other places that have it. I've been up the one in Pittsburgh. It gives you a nice view of the city. Uh, I think we've kind of hit on everything on Hotel Julian. They made that Capone suite to kind of lean into it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But the Capone suite, I believe, is on the second floor. And they believe that he used to basically take control of the eighth floor when he would go there so was the, eighth although, floor the top floor it, i don't know if it was at the time or what surprised me like a little penthouse situation for a high profile name like, like himself yeah he had a penthouse in chicago if i recall correctly that he lived out of for a while too so it's like mm -hmm. right up his alley yeah, the hauntings sure. at that hotel are a little bit different than other hotels. And as we cover more and more hotels, the it just seems a lot the same. And it does have some similarities with some, some of the other ones. Like there is a haunted elevator or a mysteriously operating elevator where it takes you to floors that you never press the button for and things like that. Little elevator game situation. Um, and then you also have your shadow figure sightings, stuff that's pretty common. But you have a couple that are different, like you have locked doors that are popping open on their own. And that's interesting. So you, a lot of times inside of hotel rooms, you'll get like the bathroom door that'll pop open or a closet door or something. But this one actually has like locked doors that'll open up on their own, which sounds extremely unsafe, <laughs> but also uh, a different kind of haunting. And then also the windows, I think you had mentioned the windows in the episode, but the windows will slam open and slam closed. Sometimes it had been really close to people's hands where mm. you could uh, potentially get injured for something like that. So something to be on the lookout if you stay there for sure. That's something you see in a couple of different locations. The windows slamming. You saw it in Amityville where it slammed the kids' fingers and they ended up being flat. It was a creepy one. And then there was the slamming windows in uh, Albuquerque at the train station there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Bree mentions, uh, she asked if we did the Iroquois Theater in Chicago, very haunted place. We did. And I'm pretty sure that is the reason that we got uh, shadow banned on TikTok, which is pretty upsetting. It is. It is. <laughs> was it is that episode. Um, but yeah, and, and then Rob had mentioned in the chat that uh, that is also where we had started mentioning Al Capone. That had to yeah. have been the first mention of him, right? And then it's just from there, it's been every single location since. Yeah, it just seems like he just continues to pop up. Um, Brennan, Brennan said there was sadly no oubliette in that episode. <laughs> or <laughs> Not that time. Yeah. But, we, but we found some in Iowa which we'll get into shortly. Like I never, I never thought that I was going to be one of those places that we found pirates, but it, it does make sense when you think about it. Um, the other place we covered, speaking of theaters is the, the grand theater in Dubuque, Iowa, which is extremely haunted. And I found the theater really interesting just based on the history. Like before we even get into the hauntings, just like, how this theater was converting to stay current with the times for a while, where it opens up as like a place that they do plays and stuff like that. And then they see the, they see the writing on the wall with like the, the movie theater stuff. And in like the 1930s, they do this, they do this conversion and they convert it into a movie theater, which a lot of people don't, didn't do that in the time. I mean, there was plenty that did, but a lot of people like try to hold on, to what they were and they like get real stubborn and they're like no this is what we built but they did a conversion and they made it a movie theater and during that conversion 
around that time is where we start to hear about the haunting. So the, the hauntings date back to 1930 where different cleaning staff was going in there and experiencing the same things over and over again that happened all the way up till today. And they've done more construction projects and they've reverted it back to its original um, aesthetic, basically. And we just get stories of hauntings. And I thought that they were pretty unique stories relative to a theater. Um, some they stuff were. like that you hear in other theaters and stuff. The camcorder one really stood out, right? Like that story where the, the gentleman's filming the performance and his camcorder just starts zooming in and out, zooming in and out. And he's like, dude, this thing is broken. What is going on? Shuts it off. He's talking to other people. And this woman goes, hey, you know what? That actually happened to me as well. And then after they review the footage, they see the figure of somebody in frame before it starts to do the the zooming in and out and it's on both cameras that's awesome yeah that's you always hear about the weird situations where you know equipment gets messed with like um electronic equipment and it's usually like ghost hunting equipment right but then you have this is obviously a, a video camera mm -hmm. and you know the zoom thing starts getting messed with and to see a, a silhouette that's very creepy yeah. yeah very unique something similar happened to us at the oliver house where we had included a little bit of the footage uh, in the episode, but it was one of our cameras just started kind of focusing in and out, in and out, in and out, which isn't anything crazy, but that's the only time that it happened that night. And that was around the same time that we had uh, some intelligent communication on the spirit box. So those things kind of work together, obviously not as extreme as it's zooming way in and out and seeing an actual ghost in the footage, but we had like orbs and things in, in that exact moment. So a little bit, it just reminds me of that situation, but that's uh, that's obviously a much more extreme one there at the theater. Haunted theaters are so cool. And you're right about like the, the whole conversion thing. Mm -hmm. Like why wouldn't it, it can't take much because you already have the seating arranged. You already have a stage and everything like that. Just add a drop down screen and throw a projector in there and you, you're pretty much good, right? There can't be too much more that you need to do to maybe a sound system, I guess. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, movie theaters that go for that aesthetic. Like they, they have a movie theater and they try and make it look like it was an old opera house. Right. You have the, the curtains. Like they still have the curtains that draw open when mm -hmm. the, the movie's about to start and stuff yeah so it's cool to actually see one that really was that really did have you know did used to be that coolidge surprised, theater is what I, don't do it yeah coolidge theater around here is the one that i think of that has that that we've gone to we and if you're in the boston area like i'll give them a free plug they do like midnight showings of old movies and stuff and it is a blast i mean oh, we're too so old fun. to do it now we, we've too done it yeah <laughs> but doing a midnight showing at coolidge theater whether it be like a horror movie or doing the show. We went and saw The Room there for one of the those. Goat. And the goat. one one of the best movie going experiences I've ever had in my life. That was my was... first time seeing the movie The Room. If you guys oh. haven't seen The Room yet, it is a uh, don't blame us when you do watch it, but it is arguably the worst movie ever made and best. the best and the movie best. ever made at the same time. It is to, so... to a point where they had recently made a movie about how in the world that movie ever got made with James Franco. Mm -hmm. What was it? It was uh, the disaster artist. So if you yeah. guys haven't seen the room yet, great book too. Um, the disaster artist, the book is like so well done. Um, mm -hmm. Whole tangent here, but let's yeah. get back to the, the coolest theater. The coolest theater is one that that uh, fits the bill of of definitely feeling like an old theater. I don't. What was it ever like a play theater, or is it just kind of just has that look? I've never looked into the history of it, but it could. I would. I wouldn't be shocked if it was right. Like it, it feels like it. You go in there, you get that feeling for sure. It's definitely old. Yeah, it, it's an older one. I enjoy. I enjoyed it thoroughly there, though. I, I'd love to do more stuff there. Um, go see just to go see movies there. It's a lot of fun. Um, let's go back to the, the hauntings of this theater though in Dubuque, and the other one. So we see like on stage a lot of hauntings happening. There's a bunch of stuff going on with like set designers that are hearing stuff like people dragging stuff as they walk, which is all creepy. The other one that I found the creepiest of this place is the stage production. They're rehearsing on stage and all of a sudden they see a group of spectators in the back of the theater in like old 1920s, 1910s clothing and they see them for a second and they disappear and then they pop up in a different part in the back of the theater and then they disappear again and then i think it happens one or two more times 
and all of a sudden they're gone. So you just see them like teleporting around the back, like manifesting in different spots of this theater. And then they're just gone. Like after a few seconds, it's nice. Yeah. That's different from other theater hauntings. We've covered a few of them now on the show. Iroquois theater, which we mentioned earlier was actually one of them, but th that one they would see like shadow figures basically sitting in seats, but that seemed to be like one at a time to see a whole group of them and see them in period clothing. That's, that's, no, that's a whole other level. It's awesome. Yeah. Like a, like a flash, like, psh, 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 and then just gone. It's, that's scary. It's, that's horror movie stuff. Yeah, it's it's literally something from like um, Insidious or something like that, yep. where they're just like flashing around the room for a few seconds and then gone. And you know, there's other stuff they talk about, like during uh, decorating for Christmas, boxes were moving to other side of the room on their own, like completely potential poltergeist activity. Yeah, um, which we almost named the episode, but we got into a gigantic fight today. <laughs> We can never get on the same page there's about naming there's episodes. <laughs> there's a difference between giant fights and just daily roasting of each other. It's different. Rachel says the bingo card should have included a sidetrack talking about Boston. <laughs> we, know. we do that. We can't help actually, it. I looked into the history of the Coolidge Theater. So it was built in 1906. It was originally a church. And then it got oh, converted wow. over into a movie theater in 1933 as the community's first movie theater. So I can see that. If you're in the Boston area, Cambridge is, I think it's technically part of Boston, over the river. But anyways, um, go check it out. Uh, Brodad says Rocky Horror Picture show in Harvard Square at midnight with Jesse. Yeah, actually, we did that. The Rocky Horror Picture. That was a live show. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they've converted that one over to a movie theater, but once again, we are sidetracked talking about Boston. So when that gets added to the bingo cards, go back and check this one off. Everyone will uh, win. Everyone will win. Um, is there anything else in the theater you guys found interesting? Or do we want to sort of move on to the main event? Because I do have a few other haunted locations in Dubuque that I want to talk about. Ham house time. Let's talk about ham. Let's talk about some ham. Yeah. Um, so this to me, I learned a lot about stuff that wasn't even like paranormal related when I was in, when I was going over this house. Like I, I learned stuff that we see in other houses. I learned why it's there based on some of the research I did on this house. So in we're the, strictly talking about ham right now, right? Because pretty yeah. much everyone's got ham in their house. You guys ready to talk about every way to, to you know, make ham? Because that's what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah. No. So, like, when people were designing their houses in the eighteen late 1800s, early 1900s, they didn't design it the way that, like, we do today, where we're like, we kind of go for a theme throughout the house, like, with our color and our carpets and all that stuff, right? Like, we try to make it very i guess feng shui is the word we're looking for or something where the word is honey glazed okay all right <laughs> um <laughs> what, <laughs> what it was they, a damn joke <laughs> i i knew where we was going it was just not a good one i didn't i didn't enjoy it um negative points on that one jesse i'll tell you where we are going next week hamsterdam <laughs> I'll mute my microphone. You guys have a good chat. Mm. We're talking about pig-based products in Iowa. Last time we did this, it was worse. What was the last time we did this? Velisca. Oh, oh okay. yeah. <laughs> oh my God, we've done Iowa. I thought we hadn't done Iowa yet. Oh yeah. Look at that. Yes, we have. Last time. If you haven't God. heard the Velisca episode and you want that reference, go back out and check the Velisca yeah, episode we'll out. Try to, try to keep this one as PG as we can. <laughs> Um, all right. So when people were decorating their houses in the late 1800s, early 1900s, what they would do is it would be on our per room basis, right? So they would do it like, that's why you would see like the jungle room in one, one part of the house, or you would have like this room and it would be a completely different color scheme, different carpet, different decorations. It was almost like you were going through like a museum of different types of things per room. So I never understood why they did that, but that it was considered like cultured or something back in the day. And so that when people came over, they could host people and like change the aesthetic per room when they were hosting people. I what noticed that. that I noticed that in the video and I can't tell you how much it bothered me when the carpet just completely changed colors. And I was like, this is not okay. Different time. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. it was the same design, but it was just one red and then one blue. 
And yeah. it's just like, oh God, that's awful. Like at least put some sort of like a runner or something like some sort of a threshold there to break it up a little bit, but just straight from one carpet to the next. Brutal. I think yeah, they did like, that at the Sally House too. Mm-hmm. Well, the Sally House was all red, wasn't it? I think there was a green carpet all, too. Car- so much carpet in that house. Like, dude, what is underneath that carpet? Find out immediately. Your Demons. carpeted bathroom, you psychopaths. <laughs> Hometown ghost interior decorations. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're very concerned about what the houses that these ghosts are living in. Anyways, like I just found it interesting that that's because we've seen it in other houses, but no one's ever like really pointed it out until I looked at this one. I'm like, okay, well now now I understand what I'm looking at when we go to these older houses, and we see like why it looks so chaotic. Basically, it's chaos for the most part. Um, so there you go. That's why. That's why they do that at these houses. But I found the story of the Matthias Ham house really interesting in the aspect that like Matthias Ham built it and it did go to his wife and then his daughter, but nobody else like owned this house other than the Hams and then the town. So there was like no changing like owners and different ones coming in it was kind of cool the way it did die i mean the the way that it did transfer was the lady was like listen i'm gonna sell you this property Mm -hmm. under one condition i'm gonna stay here until i die and she didn't die for like another like nine or ten years or whatever but the town was like that's fine and then once she did die they they took it over and then they did nothing with it why did the town want it was it just for historical reasons yeah historical Yeah. yeah I don't know though because they they bought it in like 1910 and it had only been around for like 50 years. Hmm. I'm wondering if it was more like a property, like because it was a large property. So in the future, when they did finally start doing stuff with this, so they, they moved. It. Well, they didn't because what they ended up doing was that might have been the original plan, but they have the first schoolhouse. They moved it to the property. So like when you go to the museum here, you will see the first schoolhouse from Dubuque. And there's also the first log cabin that was built in Dubuque on the property as well. I was trying to find some hauntings attached to those, but they moved both of those structures to the Matthias Ham House property. And when you go there for a, a tour, you can walk through those places as well. That's pretty cool. Do you know when yeah. the, the log cabin was built originally? I did know the date, but I don't remember it offhand. Mm-hmm. But it, it's believed to be the first structure built in the general area of what is now Dubuque. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So very cool stuff there. But they let it sit there until like the Town Historical Society was put together. And then that society started to make plans for it and renovate it and restore it and, you know, opened it as a museum. And it sits there today. And it's looks like a really cool house. Like not even to just go like investigate, but to just like I said, go walk through that house and you can just see what it was like in a different time in Iowa. Yeah, even like with Iowa these, of all places. With a lot of these houses, like even when they're not allegedly haunted, doing a tour of these houses is still awesome. Um, a lot of them, like the ropes are uh, the rooms are roped off, and you can kind of see what it was like in that house at that time. It's especially shocking when you see the bedrooms and the fact that there's a fireplace virtually in every bedroom, and you still get like the bed warmers and just how cold and breezy some of those rooms are and you wonder how people lived like that sometimes it's pretty crazy but then it's even more awesome if you could do the the houses that are haunted so there's that ian asks who had sidetracked by carpet on their bingo cards <laughs> that's a good question <laughs> um but it's also then, really interesting sorry that, that that and you brought it up that the house wasn't even that old when the town agreed to to take it over so i, I do wonder if they had a different plan for it maybe subdivision or something like that or maybe they just planned to make it into like some sort of a town hall or something because it was a big property and mm-hmm. then it makes sense that the historical society would have taken over the house as well yeah and then getting to some of the history of the house matthias ham you know he builds it as a one as a one floor house his first wife passes away and then he just builds this like almost like mansion Afterwards, he just adds all these floors to it and continues to build upon it. And then this guy loses all his money. He he keeps losing his money. And although he loses his money, he finds a way to keep the house in the family while he's alive. He works hard doing other things. Whenever he would squander his fortune. I think he squandered his fortune like twice. Like Probably on all the home renovations. <laughs> Probably. 
just building it all out of limestone. It was on property. He thought that. Got to stop building this thing out of ham. He thought the the animals are having a field day with it. He thought that the town was going to expand one way. So he was buying property up that way and everything went the other way. So like he bought all this property that was essentially worthless. And yeah, so that was how he lost it. And then when it goes to his next wife, she finds ways to keep the house as well. She rents out rooms to people. She does everything she can to keep it. And then the daughter, she sells it to the town, but she also makes it. This is the, this is what I wanted to try to find a little bit more out on because I think some of the hauntings might be um, part of this. She rents a portion of the house out to a, to a cancer center. And it doesn't really specify what that cancer center is doing there. If they're treating patients, if patient patients are staying there. Um, but that's a lot of trauma. Like regardless that's yeah. passing through those doors. Um, and it's going to be a memorable place. That's where you were getting treatment or whatever. And, there could be more to that that we just don't know about. Yeah, it is an important distinction whether or not patients were being housed there because obviously that, you know, you have sick patients, obviously death can happen and that would be a, a different level. But a house this old is going to have uh, deaths in it anyways and that's not the end all be all to hauntings anyways. So hopefully it wasn't the same doctor who had the cancer center in Arkansas that we covered recently. Yeah, hopefully yeah. it's a different one. I think cancer I think centers, was. yeah. Seems like this one might have been a little more legit from mm. the limited research that I did do on it. Um, yeah, well, that guy didn't set the bar too high. <laughs> no, he did not. <laughs> That's true. He didn't at all. And then we get a ghost pirate. Love it. Finally. I was so uh, happy to hear the... Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> there we go. But that's on. Nice. Boom, boom. Nailed it. <clears throat> you were so yeah. happy to hear what? I was so happy to hear the uh, the pirate, the spooky pirate track at the end of that. It was fantastic. I missed it. I added yeah. it in and I was like, Rob's going to complain and make me change it, but I'm going to put it in anyways and hope he doesn't complain. And luckily I got him the audio a half hour before the episode aired. So we didn't have time to complain. Well, I mean, I just, I, you blew my eardrums out at one point and we had to fix it, but that's, I couldn't hear the rest yeah, of it. It was like an actual jump scare right there too. Yeah. For me, it was like a solo. It was just for me as I'm, you know, fixing things for the uh, episode. Things people no one cares about. No one cares that I'm the only one that got scared. Uh, but they care, talk- they care that the end product sounded great. We and just we're, teased we're a ghost really. pirate, and we're not talking about the ghost pirate. People are losing. We're getting two star reviews right now because we didn't talk about the ghost pirate, right? Probably. But we need to bump these back up to five star reviews, and let's let's hit on this ghost pirate because I think the tale is pretty interesting. Where it starts with Matthias himself, he used to go up in his house and look out on the river. And watch his boats. And then one day he sees it under distress by like these river pirates, uh, reports them to the authorities. And supposedly they're like, they like tell him they're going to get like curse him or something. And it's like, bro, you could, you were doing something bad. He was just protecting his shit. Like, what do you want him to do? Like, oh, I guess that's gone. I guess I'm just going to let them Niches take those boats. Stitches. Yeah. So that's the model that pirates created. So then his daughter takes over the place and one night she hears like somebody rummaging around downstairs and she's like reading a book and she's a little nervous. And then she goes downstairs the next day and notices that, yeah, somebody was in the house going through her stuff, talks to the neighbors. They set up this plan that if it happens again, let's light a light in this particular window. And sure enough, the next night it happens. She hears somebody on the first floor rummaging around. She lights the light. She yells out, hello. Um, The person gets startled, comes upstairs to do who knows what. And uh, she's a badass. And she just like takes two shots right at the door. Thank God it wasn't one of the neighbors coming to check on her or something like that. I was thinking that when you were telling the story, I'm like, oh, where's this going? (laughs) Yeah, right. So like, and this person, they leave and they find him down by the river. Like they follow this trail of blood. And he's dead by the river, and they knew that it was this local pirate captain that everybody knew that was rummaging through the house, and she shot and killed him. He's dying in a pirate ship down by the river. <laughs> oh, my God. You stole my joke. I was doing the down by the river joke later. Ah, sorry. Wow. Not anymore. Not, Not anymore. anymore. All right. That's going to do it for this week's episode. We'll <laughs> talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so, so we get a river pirate ghost in Iowa, which... I'm going to be honest, 
when we started this show a little over a year ago, if you had told me we we're going to be covering up pirate ghost in iowa i would have been like yeah no way yeah i didn't really know river pirates were much of a thing no this show has enlightened me to river pirates because it's not the first ones we've come across it turns out that anywhere there's any significant body of water there will just be pirates it was on the great lakes we found lake pirates now we have river River. pirates (laughs) and nobody travels better than pirates except for al capone's ghost (laughs) I'm going to put together Apparently. a little boat so that I can be the Carver's Pond and Bridgewater uh, pirate ghost when I die. It's just, you know, it's, it's not like a good I'm... idea. Why? You're going to get caught. <laughs> <laughs> the pond pirate was caught again. <laughs> Third time this week. He Turns out there isn't much to steal on that besides rowboats again. <laughs> The half mile radius of the pond was not was was easy. <laughs> it was easy to trap them. <laughs> yeah, what are you gonna steal? Fishing poles? Like what? What is, what is there along those? <laughs> Don't you worry about Kate, what I'm gonna steal. Kate called you a puddle pirate. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, you see it heavily raining outside. You're like, oh no, the pu- the puddle pirate will be back tonight. So this this ghost pirate is. In the house, as well as they think Matthias Ham as well is one of the pirate, uh, one of the ghosts in the house, and those are the two prominent ones. But I, I think there could be more. You had, there is supposedly a suicide that happened, but I couldn't find anything on it, so I didn't include it because I, I couldn't figure out who that was supposed to be or any backstory on it. But you had family members that died here. Again, there was the cancer center here as well. Um. So I think there might be a little bit more to the hauntings than just those two. I don't know what you guys think about it. Well, like we always say, it's hard to pin down exactly what haunting could be tied to what ghosts. So if you have like two specific entities that you believe haunt there, but then you're hearing footsteps and lights are turning on and off or whatever, whatever the cliche haunting thing that you're seeing is, how do you know that that's being attributed to those two specific entities and not something else? You know, mm-hmm. yeah. What about you, Jesse? It's, well, it's hard to pin it down I mean, unless you have something repetitive. Then you could attribute it to the same ghost. But with the whole scientific method, I mean, you're dealing with you need the same evidence to be repeated over and over, over and over to number one, attribute it to a haunting and not just a noise in the house, and number two, be able to attribute it to which ghost could be haunting. And I'm pretty particular about this. We've mentioned it a few times. It's like, how do you know that's the same ghost? Mm-hmm. Like in hotels where they have the second floor ghost and the third floor ghost, like, well, how do you know it's not the same ghost just going up and down? Yeah, so. I feel the same way. There's so for this one, there does seem to be a darker entity on the third floor, which I think does make sense with the with the pirate ghost because that's where he would have gotten shot. A very traumatic event happened to him on that floor, and that seems to be where people feel more negative energy. And then the rest of the house, they feel like generally more of a positive. I guess like people say that if you taunt Matthias, he'll like react aggressively. But we've seen that with other ghosts, too. It's not just like Matthias Ham is the only one that's doing this. Uh, He slammed that door from that one guy that was mocking the spirits of the house, basically. Um, So, yeah, it's it's tough to pin down who's doing what. The one that I found interesting that they think was Matthias was the curator that got like like in the house when it was real dark and they couldn't find their way down the hallway and they felt a spirit like guide them through the darkness to where they needed to go. That's a pretty interesting story. We haven't heard something quite like that before. It's one of those helpful ghosts. We get that from time to time. Yeah, so that was that was a pretty interesting one. I mean, it's it said seemed... that like most ghosts that haunt places are not evil entities. They might end up being scary anyways because it's a ghost and a ghostly encounter, but a lot of times they're just trying to help, you know, for intelligent hauntings. Mm-hmm. It's like, what else are you going to do? You're sitting around this house for an eternity for you don't even know what reason. Might as well help people out while you're around, you know? Yeah. yeah. You wonder there's there's, there's ghosts that like clean up things, ghosts that tidy up, ghosts that will lead you through the dark. Go ahead, Dave. Sorry for cutting you off. I'm sorry. I was saying you wonder if that these some of these intelligent hauntings are just sitting around forever and deciding whether or not they like the people that live in the house or not and if they like them maybe they're helpful and if they don't like them maybe they're menacing mm. yep casper the friendly ghost situation mm. or i mean like 
we we seen this in the Sally House where the Sally the Sally House ghost or entity was perfectly fine with female inhabitants and then when there was a male they were not so pleased and that's when things really uh picked up yeah, yeah. we've actually seen that in uh multiple locations i believe at the oliver house to bring it up again i think there was one spirit that i don't think it liked women and, yeah uh, and then there's plenty of locations where it's just men in particular get targeted yep. in the not the caves but the tunnels in edinburgh I think it was like pregnant women, particularly it might be the graveyard. I don't really remember, but somewhere in Edinburgh, it was pregnant women in particular would get targeted by these uh, ghosts or poltergeists or whatever. So scary stuff, definitely something to research before you enter a haunted location mm. is, are you at risk? Especially if there's something that could cause physical harm, like a poltergeist or a demonic entity or whatever. Got to be careful. Got to be careful. Yeah. So I think that kind of does it for the Matthias ham house. Do we want to move on and just hit on these last two locations from Dubuque? Let's do it. For sure. So there's also the old jail, and they're fairly certain that the person who haunts the old jail is Patrick O'Connor. And Patrick O'Connor was a dastardly character, not exactly a pillar of the bustling mining community of Dubuque. He was a man with not only a mean streak, but he had temper and self-control issues and a rather violent history. It seemed he liked to get his way by terrorizing others. So he terrorized a merchant, tried to kill him by burning buildings and shooting at the merchant through the door. He was nearly hung by an angry mob, but escaped, fleeing to Dubuque and not learning from his bad behavior. He again set himself up as the town bully in Dubuque, shot a young miner named George O'Keefe five times in the chest after forcing open the door of O'Keefe's cabin. He was caught and once again nearly hung by a mob, but cooler heads prevailed. The next day, the trial was held under a large tree. The very next day, so super different times, right? Um, under a large tree near the present old jail building. So just outside by a tree the next day, they have this trial. Um, he, gets a, he gets a defense attorney that he knows. There's eyewitnesses. The jury deliberated and Patrick was found guilty. And then he was hung on June 20th, 1834, only a month after the murder. So it's go good that the, that things have changed, you know, obviously in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like back then they were just like, yeah, we know that you're the guy that doing all the things. So we're just going to catch you and move this right along quickly. Cause everyone knows, <laughs> but due yeah. process is important. I'm glad we have it. So then they built the jail on the site of his hanging spot, basically. And they say that he was, he's not as active as he used to be since it became a museum, but there was a time period where he was a very like mischievous and basically bullied people as a ghost. He would like push people, attack people, um, do all the things that he would do in real life when they finally put electricity in he was turning lights on and off so all the normal stuff um and he would go to places where like no one else should be in the prison like they were off limits places and then things would be happening there so patrick would go and mess with uh the guards and also the prisoners and just like mess with everybody in there and he was seen a few times he was dressed in the attire of a frontier man um and something that was pointed out every time that they saw him was his unfriendly eyes. Ooh. So, yeah. So oh, a little scary. Yeah. Reminds me a little bit of the uh, ghost that haunted the Whaley house criminal hung on site kind of situation. Mm. Was that the Whaley house or the hotel Del Coronado? Whaley house. Yeah. Same episode right. though. Right. So there's also the redstone, um, bed and breakfast which is not quite as um ripe with the history of that old jail but basically there's this old old building there's the spirit of an older gentleman that shows up he's well dressed good natured older gentleman who is thought to be augustine who is the man who built the, the property he's seen throughout the mansion going about his business enjoying the rooms so again somebody that built the place that is haunting it and there's unknown spirits that believe to be part of his family 
they've heard disembodied voices, shuffling footsteps in the hallways and bathrooms, and feet on the stairs. Playful knocks on the doors have also been experienced. So it's another location that is relatively haunted in Dubuque. Just uh, not as much to go on as some of these other places. Fair enough. Fair enough indeed. Yeah, creepy though. Yeah, it's it's a creepy looking building if you look it up as well. Um, so now it's like a, it's called the Redstone Inn and Suites, basically. So like a like a rooming situation now. Big building. People are still hearing things. Dubuque is a fun little haunted town. Like, and it really signifies what we do this show for. Where let's be honest if you're not from the area have you even heard of the town dubuque iowa dave mm. no jesse i mean i hadn't and then we find out about this town like the history of it we find out the hauntings relatively haunted town uh, more so than other places that we've covered i would say and it's it's got like such an eclectic group of hauntings there's so many different ones. We have theater ghost. We have pirate ghost. We have family history. We have everything. It's it's a yeah. It's I, I, like, like I have like a, a newfound respect for places that are different kind of hauntings. Not necessarily that this is our. I mean, I mean, there's definitely our first river pirate, but I'm sure there are other locations. And you mentioned it that you know they like to follow the waterways, or if you follow the waterways, you'll find hauntings. But it's just a different kind of hauntings that were going on inside of the buildings and everything. So. It was uh, it was very cool. Pinky, Pinky says, uh, "I need more Capone related to this content." Yeah, well, just right. there, there will be to more. every episode that we ever do, and Al Capone is most likely to get uh, mentioned in that. He finds his way into our episodes for sure. So, if that's it, gentlemen, I think we can uh, thank our patrons and spin this wheel, pick a winner for today's contest. Uh, if you guys haven't already, just type the word stickers in chat i i got all of you so far so uh give them one more them. give them one more minute i'll read our five star reviews and then you can thank the patrons and we'll do the wheel spin sounds good all right so we got this review from amanda k titled spooky and hilarious i started listening to this while bored during a snowstorm and i'm obsessed the storytelling is phenomenal you can tell they put a lot of work into these episodes great job guys and keep it up we do put a lot of work into it and we do appreciate you noticing that because it uh it's a lot of fun but it is time consuming to put some of these together occasionally and the other one is a new favorite um username killer tomato number 69 <laughs> is who reviewed this one and it's titled their first podcast review so we are honored that you have uh started reviewing us hopefully you review other shows as well we awesome. all appreciate it very much. But they wrote, I admit, I never leave reviews on podcast. Um, the listen while I work guy. I found you all from the Jericho podcast and been hooked ever since. I'm type to get I'm the type to get easily bored with podcasts and move on to new ones. This one I've listened to every episode, even the old ones, and can't wait till the next ones. Appreciate everything y'all do. And as long as you guys make episodes, I will be listening. So very cool thank you very much for sticking with us i and i get the sentiment i've i've hopped podcasts myself where i've listened to an entire bank of a uh, show's episodes and then i don't go back for whatever reason and so for you to come back is very cool and we very much appreciate it a lot of times they stop making episodes because their show doesn't grow because nobody leaves them reviews that's right. The listeners listen and they don't leave reviews and their show stops yeah. growing and they lose interest. So if you don't want your favorite podcasts to lose interest, make sure you leave them the five-star reviews. That's it matters true. more than you think. Uh, so let's thank our patrons real quick. Uh, for our VIPs, we have Genie R, Justin T, Lisa J, Mike B, Mom and Pops W, and a brand new VIP. Welcome to the party. Welcome to the VIPs, Robert H. We also have Stephen V, who's a VIP, and Demon King. All VIPs, thank you guys so much for subbing on Patreon and being VIPs. You are very special, and we love you very much. Uh, we also have Anna C, even better hometown ghost stories. We have Garrett, Jake V, Rachel B, Stephanie A, Sydney B, Anthony Angry, Dave Rocks T, Brandon W, Brennan B, 
Captain McSlugs, Cody G, Huggy Bear, Carrie Lee J, Mark M, Matthew T, Mariah M, Puppet Squatch, Sarah R, Sarah W, Solar Flare, Soph M, and Hooper. For as little as $3 a month, you too can join on Patreon and get your name on this list. Yes. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Before we get time. into this, before we get into this real quick, I want to say something about next week's episode. So next week, we are actually staying in Iowa, and we are covering what is a very, a uh, very scary true story that happened in the uh, early 1900s. And the reason I say that it's very scary and um, is to, I know we have a lot of younger listeners. So if you if you have your kids that listen to this show, next week might not be uh, a week to include, or maybe just listen to it first before you, because uh, there is some pretty graphic, very scary, very disturbing content in that episode. Viewer discretion is even more advised for next week. We'll have and, to get Brown to, to create a new uh, disclaimer for us, where he's extra excited about the disclaimer. Uh -huh. Also, while we're on the topic of patron members, we did our pre-show hangout tonight, which we do every other week, where we have some of our patron members, usually from the ten dollar and up tier come in and join us and we have a conversation we talk about ghosts we talk about other things i'm gonna say it now so that you have a two-week notice on the january 17th pre-show hangout which will be the next one i am gonna open it up to all the three dollar tier members and above so special week that week i will be older it is my birthday and i make executive executive decisions on my birthday week and this That's is right. what we do also, because it's my birthday week, on my birthday, January 16th, 2022 is the year I was born, according to, new, to Google. I will be a year old. <laughs> um, on January 16th, that is a Monday, we will be doing our next live Campfire Tales. So that Monday night, 9 p.m., come a join special, us. A special Rob's birthday yes. extravaganza, if you will. Mm -hmm. doing campfire ghost stories you look I'm fucking about you look fucking terrible for one by the way thanks <laughs> you are aging <laughs> rapidly it's all the pickleback shots it's his concern <laughs> yeah so this is why you don't give your newborns pickleback shots you heard it here yeah. first on hometown ghost stories yes indeed the um, console has agreed for your birthday you give gift <laughs> 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 nice campfire kills oubliettes so. will be mentioned don't you worry <laughs> So if you haven't done one of our Campfire Tales streams, we find some like short creepy pastas. Dave writes some himself. He gets real ambitious sometimes and does some pre-recorded stuff. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I write a few. Jesse's there, I guess. And sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> sometimes and, I'm here. Yeah. Last time uh, I was in and out. And we end it with telling a ghost story that we make up on the spot where we just go around and one person starts it the next person picks it up sometimes they're good sometimes they're what we did on christmas who knows what you're gonna get um the christmas one was a story is what i will say it was a story i don't know if you want to go find it but uh it's there somewhere <laughs> those surprisingly get a lot of plays on youtube compared to some of our other stuff so people are watching <laughs> I don't know, it's entertaining at least anyways okay uh here are the rules here we're gonna do this quick so uh, we're gonna do our, our wheel spin here the only rule that i have is you have to still be here to claim your prize so if you're not here and you left early i'm sorry but uh you don't win so this is for a five pack of limited edition stickers we're gonna do our first spin here and if you're here just leave a comment that says here if you haven't you have about five seconds to type stickers in chat before we spin this wheel so um yeah so this will be a five stack. I think I got all your names on here. So if uh, I spin this wheel and you go back and you look at this video and realize that your name is not here, I apologize. But yeah, okay, let's give it a spin. Let's see who the winner is. A five pack of limited edition Hometown Ghost Stories stickers. And oh, it's Cody G. Cody, you're still here. Just type here in chat and you'll be the winner. You have, you have like five seconds because we are a podcast as well. Um, <laughs> and this, this would be very, very not good. Um, so we are doing Iowa again next week. I forgot that Velisca was Iowa. Velisca is like its own state for me, mm. right? Like, and I just don't even think that Velisca is in Iowa. So I thought I was doing a whole new state this week. Uh, I'm going to get a color coded map is what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to get this color-coded map, and I'm going to know which states we haven't covered yet. 
You know what? Kate has a, uh, my wife has a, um, a little cork board that's in the shape of the United States and she has a pin for every, um, mm-hmm. she sell, you know, for her artwork that she sells for everyone who's purchased her artwork in each state and she has a pin. I might get one of those, stick it right here and put a pin in every location that we cover. There that's not go. a bad idea. So mm-hmm. speaking of, speaking of rigged, uh, we spun the wheel again and Papa Squatch ends up being the winner. So Squatch, you got it. Matthew T, if you, uh, Listen back if you're still here. <laughs> I mean, not Matthew T. I'm sorry. I'm looking at Matthew T. Claiming that it's rigged. Is it almost landed on his name too? But uh, mm. Cody G. If you're if you want to just uh, shoot us a message on Discord or wherever, and we'll send you out a couple as well. But Papa Squatch is today's winner. So congratulations, number two. Matthew T. Almost had it. He almost had it. So nicely done. That was fun. Anyways, uh, anything else, gentlemen? That's gonna do it for me. All right. Well, I think that'll pretty much do it. Thank you guys for tuning in. We will be back on Tuesday. What are we dropping on Tuesday? Horror movie review? Well, no, Tuesday we're going to do a real episode. So That's right. We plan to do a real episode on Tuesday like we do every Tuesday. <laughs> but on Friday, people should be watching what? We don't know. We don't know what we're dropping. Oh, uh, Friday will be, um, what do you call it? Uh, Pet Cemetery. Pet Cemetery, finally. All right, so Pet Cemetery, new and old. We'll be covering that. Friday the 13th, gonna, we are going to yeah. drop a Friday the 13th episode. It's so if you want to watch super the first original. Time. We're going to do <laughs> Friday the 13th movie reviews on Friday the 13th. No one has thought about it ever in the history of, of history. We're going to do a Friday the 13th on Friday the 13th, parts one and two. Indeed. indeed. Well, thanks to everybody who was hanging out, and uh, we appreciate you guys. We'll see you next week. And um, yeah, see you. going on everybody thank you for making it through another episode of hometown ghost stories if you liked that video hit like if you loved that video hit subscribe and if you hated that video well then why are you still here either way join us on all of our live shows every tuesday night 9 p.m eastern standard time that much is guaranteed but sometimes we do surprise shows we don't tell anyone we'll just show up with a live show one day and you won't know about it Unless you have that notification bell turned on. So if you don't, turn on that notification so that you don't miss any of our impromptu live shows. Catch us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, comment live, watch your comments pop up on the screen, interact with us, make fun of us, whatever. And if you want to support the show, leave us a five-star review on iTunes and we'll read it out loud live on the show. Also, for as little as $3 a month, you can subscribe to us on Patreon and join the legendary cast of patrons with your name in the credits. Plus, you'll gain access to all the extra bonus Patreon-exclusive content that we have on that platform. Either way, we'll be here next Tuesday with a brand new episode. We'll see you then.